Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the February 2016 IRCP session. I'd like to let you know that we have issued our call for proposals for the meeting this year in Saskatoon, and uh, hope to see a lot of you there. Registration is also open. We'll be sending that link out later this evening. We're pleased to have uh, Dr. Peter O'Meara with us today to talk about the uh, paper he recently published on the RESPITE model. Dr. O'Meara is a professor of paramedicine at La Trobe University. He has an academic qualifications in health administration and public policy. His doctorate examined rural paramedicine models of service delivery, and prior to his La Trobe appointment, he was employed at both Monash University and Charles Sturton University after working for rural ambulance services in Victoria for over 20 years. And Peter, we'll let you take it from here. Okay, thanks Gary. Um, firstly, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this paper. Uh, the presentation I'm giving was originally prepared for the IRCP conference in Melbourne, which I wasn't able to present for reasons beyond my control and one of my students gave the presentation. So I apologise if people have already heard part of it before. Um, it's a particularly exciting time for myself and all the people involved in this project that's been going for probably 15 years. Um, and this is really, from my point of view, is reaching the, the pinnacle of what we've been trying to do all that time. To, um, as we all know, if you talk to someone about community paramedics and they say, what is it? And um, at times that stumped us all. So here we go. So the first time, first thing we're going to do is look at how we locate community paramedicine, where it fits into the overall scheme of things, and then we'll go through a, a normal description of what a research project is, the aims, methods, and so forth. And at the end, I'll actually show you the publications that have come pretty much directly out of this project. There are a few more, but I ran out of space on the page. So community paramedicine, I, I really see it not as an add-on. I know many people see it as an add-on to normal paramedic practice, but I actually see it as changing paramedic practice, not being something that's just added as an afterthought. So I think it will change the roles of paramedics over time, and it's more a reflection of what's going on with an ageing population and a changing health service. And um, to think that it's somehow a new model that's sitting outside the existing model is probably not terribly accurate and um, I think it will have a more profound effect in the long term than people think. This particular research builds on research all over the world. Um, I shudder to think how many papers and reports I've read people I've spoken to over the years. And uh, so this information has come from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US, the UK uh, over many, many years. And it specifically builds on a project that we did in Australia about 10 years ago. And it was really the genesis of the idea of what's now the respite model. So if we like to locate the, the community paramedic, I, I think it's actually part of what I'd call a practitioner paramedic model of care. And the definition on the screen, which you can all read, I actually wrote back about 15 years ago as part of my PhD and it hasn't changed very much at all. And if you read it, those who are involved in mobile integrated healthcare, for instance, will look at that and say, well, that's what we do. Um, and that's right. So nothing is new. Um, and I was told that by a colleague at the time who is long dead now. And um, he said, oh, we used to do that in the old days. And he's probably right. So it's all tied up with all these different models around the world and often we're talking about the same thing using different names. And I know that that's been a particular passion of Gary's is to try and get people to talk the same language and we certainly need to do that. The research project that we did had two objectives. The first was to analyse how community paramedics actually make it all happen by creating boundaries and talking to people and being part of the system. So that was the observational part of the study, if you like. And um, we went to quite a lot of ambulance services around the world, informally and formally, to, to 
try and determine that. And the second aim was to come up with a, a model of care that really explained what a community paramedic was. And uh, that was more the analytical side of the project and took quite a while. Um, the analysis was done in a variety of ways and um, we'll come to some of those in a minute. So it was an observational ethno ethnographic study which means that we basically went and looked and listened to see what was going on. Um, the main part of the project, the second part, the, which was the North American component, was mainly carried out in the county of Renfrew in Ontario and many of you would be familiar with their project. Uh, there was some data that's still being analysed collected in other parts of Canada and the US and one of my PhD students is working on that quite hard. To minimise bias we recruited um, participants in a perversive way. We had two field visits by two different researchers, myself and a PhD student and uh, we interviewed, three, three of us interviewed people over a period of time over a couple of years and um, we triangulated the results. The initial questions that we asked people and the initial conceptual framework was drawn from the earlier study in Australia where we really found some domains of practice for what was then rural paramedics and um, we changed those domains a little bit after the results in the US and Canada and I used boundary theory to do the analysis about permeability permeability and flexibility, although that's not truly the focus of this talk. And before I go into findings, the, the other um, analysis technique we, we used, and it was a bit amusing, I was just telling someone in my office that um, the respite name came up in a pub in Washington and was written on a napkin. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the nap napkin anymore, Gary. I should have kept it. So what we found was that we were able to integrate the Australian and Canadian data. Um, the findings were in two parts, the community paramedicine domains which were largely based on the RISP model in Australia and there were some minor modifications to do with that to really say community paramedics could be anywhere, not just in rural areas. And then the community paramedicine enabling factors came directly from visiting Renfrew County and talking and observe, with and observing people there. And what we came up with was the response model. Um, it was originally spelt differently. Um, it was R-E-S-P-I-T-E -E originally. And one of the themes that came out in the interviews didn't fit, so we changed the spelling. So that's why it's spelt that particular way and you'll see why in a minute. This is the first of the two community paramedics and domains. And rather than me put in my definition, I've largely used the words of the people we interviewed. So where you see P4, that's participant four, who talked about the fact that community paramedics and models don't diminish emergency response because that's still part of it. The second was engagement with the community and there's no particular quote for this, but what we saw in Renfrew County and in many other places around the world is that the community paramedic models that are successful really make an effort to engage with the community and they get out there and get their hands dirty and involve other people. And that came out very strongly and we'll come back to that a little, in a little while. The next two domains are situated practice and primary health care. Situated practice is really demonstrated really well in uh, Renfrew County where they have a home visiting program where they get out and do things that are necessary in the community where they fill service gaps, where they work with other people and um, it was particularly interesting that uh, what we observed was the dynamic between the patients and the health professionals it was very changed and the patients actually made that clear as well as the staff I interviewed is that if you visit someone in their own home, you're the visitor and the power relationships change dramatically and um, that's very beneficial for the patient 
and to their care because they actually communicate with the health professional as equals. So that's a very distinctive part of being a community paramedic. Primary health care, the main thing that came out apart from doing primary health care in the home and in the community was the ability of the paramedic to navigate the patient through the health system. Um, even though the Canadian health system is a universal health system and is probably not as complex as some others, um, it was still complex enough for the patients to have difficulty knowing where to go to for help. And the paramedics were doing that, even though at times they actually found it quite challenging, and we'll come to that in a minute. So they're the four community paramedics and domains that we basically have identified and described. What we came up with in Canada, in particular, was what we called enabling factors. And the first of those was about the integration with health, aged care and social services. And this is where it's quite different to the traditional model where we tend to integrate with hospitals and medical services, and that's very important. But it's more than that. Um, what they were doing was integrating with aged care in particular, and we all know about the ageing populations that developed countries have, and with social services, and that could be home help or hospital in the home or could be the local plumber to come fix the toilet. Um, there's all sorts of things that patients need and have to be connected with. And they were doing that in a very creative and open way. The second one was governance and leadership and this is why the respite uh, spelling was changed because I was really keen to talk about governance. Um, I, coming from Australia, when I, every time I go to the US, I'm perplexed by medical dire direction and the way it's done there. And um, when I went to Canada, the issue of medical direction was raised actually by doctors who made the point that they didn't think that the current model of medical direction was particularly suitable for community paramedics because it's much broader than emergency medicine. And of course, some of the paramedics in particular raised the issue about self-regulation of the profession. And that's an ongoing debate and discussion in Canada and many other countries. The last two enabling factors are higher education, and that links back to being able to navigate through the system and understanding what other people do, and also having some level of self-regulation. Um, in particular, you'll see that Participant 3 made the point that the current education system really doesn't give paramedics much of an education in things like health determinants, um, in social determinants of health, or how the health system it works. What they found was, like many of us, we learnt this by trial and error, by experience, and uh, they suggested that there should be that sort of thing put into higher education programs alongside other health professionals so that we're all singing off the same hymn sheet. And of course the last one is treatment and transport options. It's very difficult to, to run any sort of community paramedicine program without having alternatives for patients. Um, it's not much point saying to someone, well, you really don't need to go to the emergency department. And they said, well, where? Because I can't stay here. And um, part of the challenge for paramedic services in general is to find alternatives to emergency departments and not just leaving people at home to their own devices. So they're the, the four parts of the model. And um, you can see I've, I've written descriptors, and these are very much brought together from the quotes and the discussions, the observations. And um, we think it makes sense. Uh, the response to emergencies was originally rural engagement, and we flipped that around and the engagement became the, the second one instead of emergency response. So they're just flipped. Situated practice, I think, is very important to community paramedicine because it does distinguish it where we can actually adapt, and, and that's the big strength of the model. Primary healthcare speaks for itself. 
integration again is a very strong characteristic of community paramedicine and not just in health. Governance and leadership, I, I mentioned it was very important to have effective governance and leadership and you know, I really do think that the paramedics need to lead these programs um, in consultation and collaboration with other health professionals and I just talked about the treatment and transport options being really important. So this isn't about me talking on and on here. What I'd like to do is get other people involved. I have some questions here about um, the distinguishing features of community paramedicine compared to the other models, the key challenges for paramedicine in the future, and some of the professional and policy issues. So Gary, if you would like to open it up, um, people can start to talk about this. I have a couple more slides with what I think are the answers, but I'm interested to see what other people think. Okay, we're going to unmute your lines now. So if you've got any background noise, if you could uh, mute your own phone until you're ready to speak, that would be great. The conference has been unmuted. Who would like to start out? Mark, you've got a particular model there in, in Boise. Do you want to uh, hit the discussion point? Hey, Gary. So actually, there are three of the community paramedics in here right now. And we, we actually had a kind of a question related to bullet number two, the key leadership challenges for the paramedic, paramedicine discipline and paramedic services with regard to all of these models. And that is... Uh, related back to outcome and process measures. Um, even though every program is different, uh, we are kind of working with the challenge of coming up with standardized measures and both for process and outcome. And so I didn't know if anyone on the line could speak to that, what, the, what kind of challenges they faced with regard to that subject and how they've overcome it. I can partly answer your question. Um, Everyone asked the same question, you know, how do you measure the outcomes? And my argument for the last four or five years has been that's a really good question. However, until you know what a community paramedic is and what a community paramedic program aims to achieve, you don't actually know what to measure. And I guess the push in this paper has been let's describe what it is, what people do, now we can start measuring. Perfect, thank you. Any more questions? I can move on and give my answers. Well, Peter, why don't you go ahead? Okay. <laughs> okay. The first question was what are the distinguishing features of community paramedicine? And I think the, the most obvious thing is that they, they have an adaptability to different settings. And that's been demonstrated pretty well across the world. Um, the programs that I've visited all over the place have um, been very different to each other um, in some ways. And their settings have been different. Some have been in rural, some have been in urban. Some have been in poor areas, some in very affluent areas. So they do seem to work when there's a need. So they're adaptable. The second point is that I think the inclusive engagement strategies to integrate with the community and the health systems are very important and very much a, a bottom-up approach. And um, I know it's not the case in all countries, but certainly in Australia, one of the characteristics of ambulance services are that they're very big, um, they're well funded, they have lots of people determining direction and the community consultation tends to be ambulance services telling the community, well we can provide this service to you, this is how you should use it. There's not a particularly strong tradition of 
allowing the community to have input into um, future policy direction and um, judging how well people do things. You know, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it's very difficult to do that when you've got such large organisations with such strong direction, whereas I think community paramedicine programs in general have been very much more about going out and asking people in the community. The other distinguishing uh, point is paramedic leadership, and that was very strong in Renfrew and a, a number of others that it's really been the paramedics who've had the ideas, led it, went out and consulted with people and made it happen. Um, there was one aspect of the Renfrew program where apparently, and I actually interviewed the people concerned where some paramedics decided that some elderly people in the community who'd been discharged from hospital and needed a bit of support and they asked Mike Nolan, you know, can we just go and see these people and make sure they're okay? And, and he said yes. Uh, so it really did come from the paramedics on the ground to say, we think this is a good idea, let's have a go at it. And the, the great leadership was for the senior staff in the service to actually say, yes, go and do it. So I think that's a very strong aspect that distinguishes community pyramids and from the way we've done things, which is very much a command and control system. Peter, I've got a couple of comments before you go to that next slide. Okay. Um, as I sort of look at things, I think one of the things that's happening in Canada is um, there's sort of some adoption of some similar um, tactics. Uh, for example, Toronto developed the CREMS program, and that program is sort of spreading across Canada. Uh, we see less of that in the States. Um, the, in the States, we have a lot of our programs sort of chasing some of the disease processes, and that's largely, I think, reactive to our, our payment system penalizing hospitals for readmissions in some of those disease states. So I, I think a lot of our programs are going after the prime targets of our government, which are congestive heart failure, pneumonia, and diabetes. And I think as we see our government change those penalties that we'll likely see our community paramedic programs uh, follow. Um, also in the states, I see that the organizations that are based in a healthcare system are having an easier time getting their programs running because they're not, um, our system is built on, on chasing encounters still. Uh, but the health systems are changing quicker than the EMS agencies and um, the ones that are based in a hospital system or a clinic system find other savings that are important to them and they're willing to spend money on community paramedic programs because of the rewards that they get that are outside of creating a bill for a specific patient. And the thing that I think that is um, lacking, where I think we'll see some development over the next few years, are in some standardized tools. Uh, the Canadians have been working on a tool that would quickly assess risk for falling on a hospital discharge. Uh, we don't have a lot of those concise, easy, easy to use tools. And I think that's one of the places we're probably gonna see some movement. So those are my comments on that slide. Excellent. Anyone else? Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. Some of the challenges that I've highlighted and some of these overlap with what Gary just said is the need to develop treatment and transport options for patients. Um, this is something that individual paramedics don't have the capacity to do and it needs to be done at an institutional level. And you know, I tend to agree that those paramedic services that are integrated into health systems in some way probably find this a lot easier to organise than those who stand alone and um, maybe in fire brigades and so forth. And um, the other is to actually improve our integration with health, aged care and social services. And um, sometimes we can all be pretty focused on what we're doing as emergency paramedic services, 
responding to cardiac arrest and trauma and so forth and we forget that most of our patients are actually aged, uh, people with disabilities, people with social problems and we need to really try and integrate and, and get to know the people in those sectors much better than we have in the past. And we all know that people have done this to some degree. It's just a matter of institutionalising that and, and making sure it's sustainable. So that's I see as a major challenge for all of us to do and, and think a little bit differently. Think beyond emergency response, think beyond disasters and talk about how we're going to care for the aged in our communities. Some of the professional and policy issues that I think um, are really important and some countries have made more progress than others in these areas. In terms of education and training, um, moving beyond just what we've done traditionally to get people trained up to go and respond to emergencies to have a broader knowledge base um, that embraces the public health principles and many of us would know about the agenda for the future that was done back in 1996 I think and um, it talks about paramedicine being at the intersection of emergency medicine, public safety and public health and my observation around the world is that we've spent the last 20 years basically ignoring public health and now it's becoming more important and certainly where I am we, we have public health integrated into our paramedic program. The second is to change attitudes and behaviour. Um, we all hear stories, horrible stories sometimes about paramedics treating the elderly badly and other low acuity patients suggesting that they're not ambulance cases, um, that they're loafers on the system and you know there's some element of truth in that, we all know that but often it's not the case. Um, these people are entitled to a professional level of care and an attitude that's very positive and this has really come home to me in recent times. I have two elderly parents um, who've both been in hospital in the last month, who've both used ambulances in the last six months and the feedback I get from my own parents is that they really appreciate paramedics who um, are professional and caring and you know act like uh, them calling an ambulance was not an imposition, that it was actually part of the system and you know a really caring attitude. Fortunately the people who've treated them have been very good but um, we certainly hear horror stories about paramedics having pretty poor attitudes to doing anything but an emergency call and um, that links back into education and what the expectations are of the role. The third point is that um, we need to develop around the world regulatory frameworks that allow paramedics to take lead roles rather than being subservient health professionals. A subservience taken from a Canadian paper. A um, per person um, presented at a conference and um, actually mapped out the difficulties that paramedics in Ontario are having getting self-regulation and she used the word that paramedics are seen as subservient to other people and that that was really unacceptable. Um, so we have to do something about that as a profession ourselves to um, not be subservient but to be good partners and good collaborators with other health professions. And I think the ball's in our court and those who are going to EMS today in a week or so, um, they'll get to listen to Gary, myself and Mike Nolan talking about this and having the debate in a different environment. So that'll be fun. Peter, there's a couple Any of questions, questions in the yeah. There's a couple in the chat box if you want to try to hit those. Ah, right. Okay. How do you get... One question from Kathy is, how do you get physician primary care provider buy-in? Yeah. Is that right? I Would you like to explain on that, Kathy? My, my wife's office and she signed on. Um, um, we are uh, one of those systems that we're healthcare based. We're a... Uh, hospital-based ambulance system, and we also have uh, in health care for the entire county that we're in. Uh, we have four clinics and urgent cares uh, over 78 miles of coastline, and uh, all the physicians <coughs> actually work for the hospital. And seemingly, we should be able to have great success with this. Um, however, I, I find a disconnect um, from the primary care providers, and um, so as 
is anyone else having problems with that, that they maybe don't know how to work with, uh, with paramedics may be part of the problem? Um, they don't really have a lot of exposure to us, and this is a new program. And uh, all, this, um, all the assessments and information that we're gathering uh, on their patients would be very beneficial for them to know. Like, for instance, uh, the patient that's taking her uh, deceased dog's medication for pain uh, because she uh, she doesn't have any other source for pain medications, and it's a patient that doesn't really um, uh, make her appointments due to transportation issues, the same problems all over. Uh, but it would be good for the, her physician to know that or to know that she doesn't take her metoprolol because it makes her feel bad, and, uh, and um, she uh, uses other people's medications. And this such a, uh, would be such a benefit for the uh, primary care provider providers to know this information that we're bringing back but uh, we don't, we're having kind of a hard time getting buy-in. Could you speak to that? Actually, it's a really interesting question, and um, I, I can't say who it is for ethical reasons, but I've just been reading a, um, a piece of work that's been done in um, an Asian country about the link between education and the development of paramedicine as a discipline. And the way this student did the, the project was he actually observed um, the handovers as a measure of how the professionalism project was going. And it was in relation to the introduction of a standardised training program. And the training program was actually adopted from an Australian state. Of, it was a sub-degree program. And um, he sort of made some really good points about how education can actually impact on that relationship where the receiving medical and other you know, nursing staff and so forth in an emergency department, because they know that the paramedics have been trained at a particular level, that their expectation of them is higher and they actually listen to what they say in the handovers. So I think going back to our model, I think the education side of it's really important and an education that's not isolated from the health system. I know in our program here at La Trobe University, our students do the first year of their course with other health professions in the same classes. So they get to know each other and appreciate what each other knows. And then they do some subjects throughout the course that are related to um, all sorts of um, health professions and they go on overseas trips with other health professions. So I guess that's a long-term answer, is to integrate education and training with the health sector and not do it as a standalone. But it's certainly a challenge to get that connection happening. Um, well, one of the things we're doing this year, which we've never done before, um, we're sending our students in their final year out to work in physician offices and work with them the same as a medical student would do and, and learn how physicians assess patients and the sorts of considerations they have. And we would hope that in time that will improve the communication between the medical profession and paramedics and, and make it a, a more equal, respectful relationship. Does that answer your question a little? Yes, um, that is, you know, that is kind of what I have in mind for the future here is to possibly get us, get our paramedics into the, um, the clinic setting uh, and work with the uh, mid-levels and uh, primary care providers and maybe we can develop that kind of relationship. We have a great relationship with our ED, we're part of the team there, but uh, um, most of these uh, primary care providers don't have a lot to do with emergency medicine. So that, that would, that's, that's probably the way to go. Thank you. Okay. Now the second question was what are some of the examples of paramedics being involved in governance structures and processes? Um, I can't give you any particular community paramedic ones but Gary may be able to but I can give you examples of paramedics in general being involved in governance structures and that's in Ambulance Victoria where I come from. Um, like most ambulance services we have um, a clinical governance system uh, with a, a clinical advisory committee. Um, in Victoria, the, um, the advisory committee is chaired by a paramedic and it's made up of um, a mixture of disciplines but the majority are paramedics and they determine their own scopes of practice, their own clinical practice guidelines. And um, 
when a, a paramedic, for instance, is out in the field and they want some advice, they generally ring another paramedic rather than a doctor because they're the most appropriate people to assist and give advice. You know, they still occasionally ring doctors who are specialists in a particular area, but um, generally they ring another paramedic who's based in the communication centre or someone they can contact locally. So it's very much a paramedic-led service and that extends to their helicopter service which is paramedic staffed exclusively and it's governed by paramedics. Wow. So it does work and the results are there for all to see in terms of clinical outcomes. Any further questions? I'll move on to my next set of answers. Peter, if you just mention again um, the session that we're going to do next week. Um, okay. That will that will dig into the governance. I, I think it'll be helpful if, if people are coming if we can kind of get that on their radar screen. All right. What we're going to talk about, and we've been a little controversial. Uh, I think the title is something like um, the future of paramedicines in your hands and um, we're basically saying to and, and this is not a doctor bashing exercise at all um, it's very much a challenge to paramedics to take control of their own profession and stand up and be counted and um, take responsibility um, I, I've done a, a lit review on um, medical direction and um, what I found was that there's no evidence whatsoever one way or the other whether it works or it doesn't work. So that's the first challenge just to say if you think it's so good prove it and it's pretty hard to prove to be honest. Um, the other is that there are ambulance services around the world that don't have medical direction in the American sense and they're very successful and get very good results. So there's lots of different ways to skin a cat as they say and um, maybe paramedics can take a larger role and improve things and I, I did some research in the US and Canada a couple of years ago which I haven't yet written up and um, it was really difficult to even frame the questions about how quality and safety is ensured in a paramedic service because we were coming from completely different directions when I spoke to people who had been trained in the UK or Australia, and there were a few of them who were practicing in North America or were interviewed as part of the process, they had a different take on the whole thing than those particularly in the US who really were living in a system where the physician was all powerful. And um, I guess our argument is that maybe that's not the way to develop the profession in the long term to become a profession in its own right that's well respected, where people do listen to handovers and um, where people are paid decently. So it might be a bit controversial but that's the way we, we're going to run it and um, we've got some good examples of where the systems work in different ways. Anything you want to add Gary? Uh, no, I, I would just add for those that are on that are listening from the states. Um, John John Pasco is on the call with us too, and uh, so just one of the things that I'd point out is that in Canada, the, the um, Paramedic Association of Canada owns the scope of practice, and they're currently going through the process of revision of that scope of practice, and John's leading that that process, but. Um, uh, it's completely different than what we know in the states to be true and so we're going to just uh, talk about the different countries and what's going on and um, uh, talk about where paramedics are controlling their destiny and where they're not and hopefully it'll spur some ongoing dialogue about uh, whether whether the system here is, is good or right. So hopefully some of you can join us for that. Now, one of the things we'll, we will talk about is um, professional registration as it exists in the UK where paramedics um, are registered through a, a state sponsored program the same as doctors and nurses and I think about another 14 professions and um, 
how they um, have their own boards and none of them are in any way subservient to each other. Um, and certainly it's changed in Canada just recently where the uh, Canadian Medical Association previously accredited paramedic training programs as along with a number of other allied health people and they've pulled out of that and that's really laid down the challenge to the paramedic profession to stand up and actually regulate their own education and training. So that's going to be interesting to hear because that's quite a new development in the last few weeks. Okay, if there's no more questions, I'll just move on and thank all the people who con collaborated in this. And I think it's really important to um, acknowledge that there's been a lot of people involved in this project over a long time. Uh, particularly the people in Canada, but I've been involved with three universities, uh, four universities I think, in this project over time as staff have moved around. Uh, there were four ambulance services in Australia who participated in the original study and um, there's people in the US who are involved in the continuation of the project like in Colorado for instance with uh, Chris Montero and, um, and I guess they're not listed here but Gary Wingrove and Mike um, Nolan helped with the conceptual side of it over, I'm not sure whether it's wine or beer, but we managed to come up with ideas and throw things around and, and that's what we needed. So the international collaboration has just been fantastic and um, has made a big difference to the overall project and it's given us some sort of credibility. And the final thing is to talk about the publications out of the project. Um, I filled a whole page up here of publications that we've done. There's actually more, uh, they just wouldn't fit on the page. Um, it's been my complaint I suppose over many years that too many um, paramedic services are engaged in doing really good work and doing evaluations in-house and learning a lot from what they've done and they don't share it with the world. Uh, so please do because people do read what people write and uh, it does make a difference to how people design systems and learn from everyone else's mistakes. So don't be shy about sharing what you've done and whether they're successes or failures, it's still valuable information. And I think that's the big lesson that I've sort of learned over the years is that it's a very long-term process of getting change and you'll see that some of those publications go back to 2007 and there's in fact some that go back to 2003 as well. So it's a long-term process that we're all involved in so please participate and if you don't like something that we wrote please let us know and um, you never know we might change our views because we've changed our views a fair bit during the process and um, there's a link on the site I think Gary put up for the latest article which is at the top which was in BMC Health Services Research and um, that article took a year to get published in that journal and with a lot of revisions which were very helpful and in fact we would tried to get it published for a year before that in a number of other journals and it was quite difficult. Um, it's very difficult to get published in um, emergency medicine journals because it's not quantitative and it tends to challenge the status quo a little bit I think but maybe that's just my interpretation of it. And with that, thank you. Anyone have any um, final comments or questions for Peter? Okay, well I'd just like to remind everybody again that our call for presentations for the uh, 12th IRCP session in Saskatoon on June 3rd and 4th is out and uh, we hope to see some of you um, participate in, in the session there. And that registration for that conference is also available through the Permanent Chiefs of Canada and I'll send the um, registration link through the IRCP group uh, tonight or tomorrow. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you again on the third uh, Monday in March. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Gary. Thank you.